This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, editor of the Breakthroughs newsletter. A myotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease, is one of the most serious of motor neuron diseases. It can progress quickly, with life expectancy of only three to five years after diagnosis. There's a sense of urgency here at Northwestern to study, better understand, and treat this disease, with a new faculty member leading the way. I'm Robert Kalb. I'm a professor of neurology at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm the division chief for neuromuscular medicine and the director of the Les Turner ALS Center. Let's talk a little bit about ALS. Can you describe a person with ALS and how do you diagnose them? ALS, or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is a degenerative disorder. It's a neuromuscular disorder where patients become progressively weak. And um, it's due to the selective loss of motor neurons and the neurons that instruct the motor neurons what to do. So there's an upper motor neuron that's the instructor and the lower motor neuron that is connected to muscle cells. And both of those nerve cells are vulnerable in this disease and progressively die, leading to progressive weakness. Um, Typically, the cause of death is due to um, inability to get enough oxygen in because breathing is impaired too. It's part of a family of neurodegenerative diseases, which includes Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease. Those are all adult onset nerve cell disorders. What distinguishes them is that the population of nerve cells that die is specific for each of these disorders. Although we are learning that there's a lot of overlap between them. So there are patients that have um, ALS that will sometimes have Parkinsonian features or people that have a type of dementia called frontotemporal dementia, which looks like Alzheimer's disease, but it's actually not exactly the same. And some of those individuals with frontotemporal dementia will also have ALS. So that I think that as we've gotten better at um, keeping people alive uh, over a longer periods of time because of better and better interventions, that we're seeing that these diseases, the borders between these diseases are often blurred. When somebody comes to Northwestern and they come to the ALS, the Les Turner ALS Center, what happens next? Right. So um, ALS is a clinical diagnosis. There is no test. There's no blood test. There's no imaging test. There's no electrophysiologic test that makes the diagnosis. It's a constellation of signs and symptoms, the constellations of issues that a patient will describe. You know, I don't feel right or this isn't right. I can't do X, Y, and Z. It's a combination of those um, symptoms and signs. These are things that a neurologist, when examining a patient, will say, oh, well, this isn't right, or there are there are no sensory symptoms. And so um, the, the diagnosis of ALS is made by excluding uh, other causes and um, assembling all the facts together in one unit. Typically, patients will um, first see their general practitioner and saying, you know, maybe my, my hand isn't functioning well or I can't walk correctly or I'm having difficulty articulating my speech or swallowing. Often what happens is a person is referred to a neurologist, decides that these symptoms belong in a neurological sphere. Virtually all neurologists will be able to make the diagnosis of ALS, but because it's a relatively rare disease, you, a, a clinically, you know, a practitioner um, may only see one patient once every 10 years. And so they, they, they want to be sure before assigning this horrid diagnosis that the diagnosis is correct. And then at that point, they often get referred to a more specialized place like Northwestern. And, you know, we have a clinic that um, has hundreds of patients with ALS at any one time, with many, many physicians who are quite experienced in diagnosis, diagnosing and managing ALS. You know, once a person gets to our clinic and we assemble all of the pieces of information and include the positive and the negative results, we're, we're pretty confident that, that a person will, you know, if a person has ALS, that, that we can give them that diagnosis. And then once they are enrolled in the ALS clinic, they can get um, a variety of uh, services and support through the Les Turner Center. So this is the charity which supports patients' care as well as uh, basic science research. And it's a uh, it's, um, the model is what's known as a multidisciplinary clinic. So a patient will see an ALS uh, neurologist, 
and also maybe a pulmonary doctor and then a physical therapist and an occupational therapist and a speech therapist and a nutrition and an individual with a uh, specialty in nutrition because this is important in disease, devices, communication, social work, um, psych assistance. You know, these are, we integrate all of these um, uh, services to um, make the quality of life the best that we possibly can. And, and I think that um, it's a long day, but it's a very fruitful day for the patients because they get a lot out of it. And then there are home services that are also provided through the Les Turner Center visits. You know, does a person need a ramp? Um, can it do, getting up and down the stairs. These are all part of this, this comprehensive multidisciplinary service that we provide. How do you treat someone? What are the current treatments out there that can either prolong life or increase the quality of life? The good news is that we've learned much more about the disease over the past decades. We're very good at anticipating what patients' needs are for um, um, devices to help people move around and to move safely and to uh, make sure that food goes down the right pipe. Um, there are uh, breathing assist devices. I think that they've done um, great things in improving quality of life. But I don't think that we have really um, made a fundamental change in the arc of disease. I think that basically for the majority of individuals who have ALS, it means they have three to five years from the onset of diagnosis until death. And that's why research is so important. Right. So the, the key here is to understand the underlying basic biology that's going wrong in motor neurons and cells that are supporting them and um, intervene. And I think that we're in a better place now than we've ever been. I mean, it's an incredibly exciting time for basic science research and also for translating those basic science observations into new therapies. You're very confident that there will be a cure or a very effective treatment for ALS. Maybe there'll be something new as soon as five years, you've said. What makes you so optimistic? I'm quite sure that at some point there will be a pill. You take the pill in the morning once a day and the disease never progresses. I, I'm, I'm confident in that. But whether that's six years from now or 15 years from now, I can't, I can't see that into the crystal ball and make that prediction. However, there are other technologies, specifically something called antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs, that I think are going to be fabulously powerful for the treatment of ALS patients. So in the beginning, what will happen is, I, I, I'm going to predict, that antisense oligos will be used to treat patients with familial forms of disease. We know the mutant gene. We design an antisense oligo to target that gene, to reduce the abundance of that gene. And by reducing the abundance of the toxic gene, there should be less toxicity. And the reason I'm um, very high on this technology is that there already is an example of this working. There's a childhood disease called spinal muscular atrophy. It's a childhood motor neuron disease. Um, over the past 20 years, we've identified what the genetic abnormality is in spinal muscular atrophy. We have devised animal models of spinal muscular atrophy. We have devised antisense oligonucleotides, which corrected in animal models. We have given it to human beings, and it has and had it has had a fundamental change in the course of SMA in children. We are basically curing or having a huge impact on children and infants with spinal muscular atrophy. So this is a template. This is a pathway that I know works. Identify the mutant gene, devise therapies that are use antisense oligos, give them to patients, the patients will get better. So with that pathway ahead of me, I, I, I think that it's overwhelmingly likely that antisense oligo technologies will turn out to be useful for patients with ALS. In the beginning, the low-hanging han fruit will be individuals with familial forms of disease. But I think as we learn more and more about the basic biology, and that's um, we're looking for targets in my lab that are not familial, um, that we will be able to target them with antisense oligos. So I'm I'm very high on that technology. The story kind of gave me goosebumps <laughs> <laughs> about where, where are they doing that? I'm just curious now. Where are they doing that research with the children? Nancy Kuntz and Vamshi Rao at Lori have been major players in the SMA world. Uh, this has been happening. So this is, an, this is a great story. Yeah. This is really um, an incredible success story. And uh, I, I think that neurologists, pediatric neurologists, should, are jumping up and down in excitement with this, you know, going from the gene to an effective therapy.
This is happening at Lurie Children's. So it's actually happening in many centers, but we, so Lurie has been a, a major player in this field. And let me also say that we now have teenagers and young adults with spinal muscular atrophy, which we are treating in our clinic with these antistems oligonucleotides. We have more than 25 um, teenagers and young adults who have the milder form of spinal muscular atrophy, and we are administering antisense oligonucleotides to them. And they tell us that they're feeling stronger. I mean, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So the pa- I see this as a very reasonable path. Are there going to be bumps along the road? Of course there are. Will other technologies supplant antisense oligos? Probably, maybe, who knows? I don't, CRISPR-Cas9, who, who knows? But, but th- there's a clear pathway here, and that's why I'm um, I think that we're going to have effective therapies in the relatively near future. Just tell me a little bit about where your research, how far it's come in the past several decades and where you're at right now. Let's just start by saying that um, most of most individuals who have ALS have a sporadic form of disease, which means that there's no clear genetic um, cause. And about 10 or 15 percent, there's a clear single gene which is mutated that causes the disease, and you can track it through a family. So all of our models of disease, so you need to, if you're going to study the disease in a, in a, in a mouse or in a rat or in tissue culture or, or any of a variety of other tools, genetically manipulatable organisms, um, you have to create that model by um, manipulating the gene which was defective in the patients with familial disease. So all of our models are based on familial disease. We use basically three different platforms. We use uh, this um, model organism called uh, C. elegans, Cyanorhabditis elegans. It's a teeny-weeny little um, worm that lives in the soil. By the way, six Nobel Prizes have been awarded for work using C. elegans. So that's, that's a special worm. That's a very special worm. Uh, We also use uh, primary neuron tissue culture models, which uh, nerve cells that are derived from the spinal cords of mice or rats. And we also do some studies with mice, too. Uh, As you can imagine, what we can do in the genetically manipulatable system, it happens much, much quicker than what happens with the mice. I think that looking at the genes that, when mutated, cause familial ALS points to uh, several different cell biological processes that are likely to have gone awry in um, patient cells. We think a major problem is the handling of misfolded proteins. My perspective on this is that uh, proteins are, are the, the workhorse of the cell. They are the things that, they are the um, molecules that do all the work in a cell or many aspects of cell biology. And they're constantly being synthesized and constantly being degraded. And at any one time, there's an amount of a protein in a cell, but that amount is regulated by how many new copies of the protein are being made and how fast that protein is being degraded. And just like a car wears out over time, a protein or or a part of a car will wear out over time due to use, a protein will uh, accumulate damage or will um, not function as well over time. And so the reason to get rid of proteins, to degrade them, is to keep them fresh, to keep you know the batteries completely powered and the cylinders nice and clean. We think that um, a major problem in ALS is the recognition of damaged proteins and disposal of them. And because uh, this disposal process or the recognition and the disposal process is impaired, what ends up happening is an accumulation of damaged proteins. And <clears throat> cells don't like that. Cells are very unhappy when misfolded, damaged proteins accumulate. And this is actually a common theme for all neurodegenerative diseases and actually many uh, diseases that even don't involve the nervous system. It's the accumulation of misfolded, damaged proteins. And so, uh, Part of the research in my lab focuses on how these proteins are recognized, um, how they are brought to the disposal unit. Cells have uh, trash disposal units. And um, if any of those uh, genes that we have found could become drug targets, if you could uh, facilitate the recognition and degradation of a protein and that recognition process could be drugged, if we could make a drug that would accelerate that process, 
we think that that's going to be an opportunity for um, treating patients. And so we're very actively involved in those aspects. We have several labs here that are part of the center. They're all sort of working on different aspects of ALS. Tell me a little bit about the folks that you have right now in the center, these investigators, and what they're working, some of the exciting things they're working on. I'll start with the, the most junior and go to the most senior. So um, Evangelos Kiskinis is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Neurology. Um, he is very interested in using models of ALS that are based on human cells. So there's the technology for taking human skin cells and turning them into human motor neurons and growing them in a dish, and then interrogating um, what they're doing correctly from a cell biological perspective and what's going awry. And so um, Evangelist is really uh, a, a leader in the field of this, what's known as induced pluripotent stem cell derived motor neurons. And uh, he's been supported by the Les Turner uh, Foundation. He just got um, a major NIH grant. So, you know, he's a budding superstar if he's not a superstar already. Hande um, Osdenler is uh, a little bit more senior. She studies upper motor neurons. So, as I said, the disease is a disease of the uh, command neurons or the upper motor neurons as well as the lower motor neurons. And she has uh, devised some incredibly uh, clever uh, mouse models for looking at upper motor neuron disease and what are the determinants of survival of those cells. There's another investigator, um, uh, Han Shang Deng, who is a sort of partially independent of, a, of another lab. He's, he's done some really incredibly fabulous work uh, identifying new genes that cause um, ALS and making mouse models of them. And part of that is part of a partnership with a more senior investigator, Dr. Tipu Sadiq. Dr. Sadiq has uh, been at Northwestern for decades. Um, he was part of the team that found the original gene, the first gene that when mutated causes familial ALS, mutations in a gene called SOD, SOD. Dr. Sadiq is actively involved in um, both the animal level and more molecular biological aspects of motor neuron disease. You said before that you like hard problems to solve. You're a bit of a, I actually saw you doing the New York Times crossword puzzle <laughs> when I was walking in here. Um, has that always been a personality trait for you, sort of a puzzle solver, starting to solve hard problems? I like I like you know, I like being Sherlock Holmes. I like the, I like a hard puzzle. Um, I, I like to get the positive the positive feedback when I put the last word in the crossword puzzle too. And we're not done there with with ALS, but also um, I think you need to. I, I look at this as a marathon. You you need to go long here. If it was easy, we we would already have the answer. If there was an obvious thing, we we would already have the answer. And and we don't. And that just bespeaks of the incredibly complex the incredible complexity of cells. And um, in this bizarre way, they're really beautiful in there. I mean, they do all sorts of really incredible things, but you you got to recognize that they're they've had billions of years of evolution to become very good at what they do, and we're just now having all the incredibly powerful tools to dig inside and find out what's going on. And I mean, I'm committed. I think I think everybody in the clinic, all the physicians, uh, Zenda Driss and Mike Lee and Tipu Siddiq and myself and Rob Suffid, I think we're all very committed to taking care of the patients and going long, you know, hanging in there and, and willingness to um, see it through to the end. And, and that's my goal is to get to the end, to put myself out of business. To find out more about Dr. Kelp's research, check out the latest issue of Northwestern Medicine Magazine and Breakthroughs. I'm Erin Spain. Thanks for listening.